I'd like to welcome you all to the Sunday evening services here at Champions Church of Christ. A special welcome to our visitors. We are honored that you're with us tonight and excited that you're here and want to get a chance to get to know you. Let me assure the visitors that I am not the usual public minister here. We have a fine public ministry here, uh, Larry O'Neill, and I encourage you, this is a great opportunity to invite you back uh, to hear Larry speak at another time. And for the members, let me address the question that's in your mind, which is, what is he doing up there? <laughs> um, so I, uh, I am taking classes at Harding in graduate school, and I have been for about a year. It's been kind of a quiet event. I've been able to take classes online in theology and ministry and a lot of different areas that, 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 uh, that interest me. And I, in this particular semester, I ran into this class called The Art of Preaching. And it was interesting about this class that they actually want you to preach. <laughs> and, uh, and so I had to make my uh, intentions a little bit more well known. So that's, uh, that's the background on this. And now some, even some more good news. Well, a little bit of bad news. I have to do six sermons between here and May. And quickly, here's the good news. I'm not doing them all here. <laughs> so uh, I have some other congregations that have graciously allowed me to, to speak at different times. And so I appreciate your indulgence here. And I also appreciate the elders who supported me in this endeavor. Uh, they have uh, fully backed what I'm doing in uh, Larry through the great in sponsoring this, uh, Bruce spent a lot of time proctoring tests for me. So uh, I appreciate the support I'm getting here. It's just fantastic. And I appreciate your attention tonight as we study a portion of God's Word. Uh, before we start, though, let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, uh, we thank you for this time and opportunity to come together as your disciples. And we thank you for the Bible and the, the words that are taught to us there. Father, we thank you for this church and the leadership here and the opportunity that we have to worship together as one. Most of all, Father, we, we thank you for Jesus, who makes all of this possible, who enables us to be safe from sin, who enables us to deny ourselves and follow you. Father, bless us tonight as we study your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You turn with your Bibles, be in your Bibles, uh, Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. This is going to be our anchor scripture tonight. This is going to be the reference point for our lesson. Our lesson tonight is entitled, Denying Self. Denying Self. So if you'll turn with me to Mark, I'm going to read the, the, the verses here, give us a background and a setting for what's happening here. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And he was seated, and he was stating the matter plainly. And Jesus took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. And he summoned the crowd of his disciples and said to them, Whoever, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his own life will lose it. Whoever wishes his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whatever is ashamed of me and my words, this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes and the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So the first part of this lesson I want us to focus on is self-centeredness. My purpose around self-centeredness is it's the root of all sin. If you, if you roll back any particular sin, any struggles you have in your life, struggles you see other people having, very public figures that are struggling with sin, my premise is that if you roll that back and get underneath it all, there's an element of self-centeredness in these sins, involved in these sins, at the core of these sins. In fact, if we look back to the original sin, or the first sin, we'll see that self-centeredness there as well. Of course, this is the time of Adam and Eve. This is the time of the Garden of Eden. And when you think about the Garden, most of the times so I've always thought about, you know, the Garden with you know, beautiful, lush scenery, you know, throwing a waterfall or two, maybe some birds chirping. 
you know, just something that's just, you know, it's really, it's not like Houston, it's cool and refreshing, and, and it's just a joyous place. And, uh, you know, I think that that, my inclination is that's what made them happy. But is that really it? Is that really what's behind the Garden of Eden? I'm sure it was a nice place. But if you look back at that time, there was no sin. It was a time where man was living without sin. And it's kind of hard for us to imagine that. If you'll turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, read verses 1 through 7, then we get an idea, thinking about these verses in the context of what if there was no sin? And at this time, there really wasn't. So starting at verse 1 of Genesis chapter 3, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, God has said, You shall not eat any tree from the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the tree, fruit of the trees of your garden, of the garden we may eat. From the, tree, the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day... You eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the, that the tree was good for food, and that it was a light to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate it. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves one coverings. coverings. And so we see the transition here from a sin less world, where God has made man, he's made Adam and Eve, he's made the animals, we've studied the story of the creation, and I'm sure this coming weekend as we look back and study archaeology, uh, I'm guessing that this will be a, a topic of uh, discussion, the, the speaker that's here. So we think about this creation, uh, a lot along the rock lines and the technicalities of, okay, what do you make up the first day, second day, third day, the rest of the seventh day, this was a nice place, a good garden like I talked about before. Everything was good and man sinned. But think about a world without sin. What would that be like? None of the temptations that we have today, none of the evil that we have today, none of the corruption that we have today. We think about that, one of the, one of the first things that pops into my mind is, hey, what about heaven? Maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's kind of like thinking about heaven. Now, I'm not saying the Garden of Eden is heaven and I'm not getting into some creation kind of discussion where all this has started, but I'm just thinking that sin and heaven did not mix. And, and, and there was a time when man was free from sin. And this is in Adam's time. Adam and Eve, they made this they made this discovery, the fruit of the tree. God told them not to uh, not to partake yet. They were sin free. They they were uh, thinking, you know, of themselves really when they got involved in this fruit the tree and taking it, they weren't thinking of God anymore. There was this moment for self-centeredness in their lives. And what they had is wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to live in the Garden of Eden. It wasn't enough to be sin-free and, and to live in, in, in God's glory in the Garden. No, they wanted something more. And so we see them thinking of themselves, thinking, what else can I get? What am I missing? Well, I'm not quite like God. And, and, and the serpent here says that if I partake of this fruit, then I'll have that. So there's a desire for more. There's a, there's a first appearance here of self-centeredness. And the first appearance of self-centeredness coincidentally equals the first sin. This sin is obviously very significant. We still have sin with us today. Uh, this, this, this original sin flows through the ages like a river. Uh, that, that sin has flowed through time where we still see it today. It impacts all of history. If you look at history, you haven't studied in school, you like history, you read about it, you think about it, you can ultimately see society, different societies, demise, dictators, leaders. Sin is everywhere. And, it, and it's the root of everything that's bad. Even the, the key Bible figures that we know and love have been wrapped up in sin. We talk about Abraham and his lie about Sarah. You, you think about Noah and the sin that was in the world at the time. How God was ready to get rid of it, and He did. He flooded the world to get rid of sin. It tells you how much He despises it. It also tells us how much sin is in the world during this time. So there was sin even in these times. Moving on to Joseph, the sin of his brothers, throwing him into the pit. 
And then we have David, one of my favorite Bible characters, a man after God's own heart, somebody that we should, we can model ourselves after because of his love for God and how he followed God. But David, as we all know, fell into sin. He committed adultery with Bathsheba, made the consequences, was was repentant and asked for forgiveness. But ultimately, sin entered his life and changed his life forever and, and, and changed his destiny, just as it does ours. And then finally, Solomon, uh, the one that follows David, and, and he's the wisest, he's the wisest man. He's wise. You think of him uh, you know, in our Bible stories as children, he's the wise man. He made all these great decisions. He, he, he could see things, he had knew how to build a strong uh, kingdom. And, he was just this great leader. But even Solomon, in all his earthly wisdom, we see him fall, uh, fall prey to idol worship, not doing what God had said, marrying marry, uh, women from other areas that would influence him. And ultimately, even he is wrapped up in sin. We go through time until we get to the New Testament. Sin is prevalent everywhere, and behind all this sin is an element of self centeredness. It's a focus on myself, my, you know, my needs over what God wants or what anybody else wants. It's in all of these different stories, these different characters that I mentioned. It's in our lives today. But yet there was one. There was one who came and was free from sin. I think you know what I'm talking about. And this is Jesus. Jesus comes and becomes flesh. He dies and rises from the grave. And he redeems us from sin. Come with me to John chapter 1, and read verses 14 through 17. It's a very powerful verse that's significant to all of us and describes how Jesus came. It defines who he was and how he, how he ministered to us as deity. Starting in verse 14 of John chapter 1, and the word became flesh and rolled among us. And we saw his hope, his glory. Glory is the only begotten. From the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I. For he existed before me. For of his fullness we have received, we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So here's Jesus, he's sin free. You read the stories of Jesus throughout the uh, Synoptic Gospels, through John, throughout the you read the stories through the epistles. Everything you can find out about Jesus, you don't find anything self-centered about Jesus. Jesus thinks of others. He's constantly thinking of others. He's putting other people ahead of him. His needs. He is. Uh, he is a great example for us of how to remain sin-free. And, and the core of his sin-free living, I think, was Jesus loved other people. He thought of others before himself. And that is the that is the key thing that helps set him apart from any of these characters we mentioned before and enables him to be sin free. Um, so we we use this example of Jesus and we say, hey, you know, it was Jesus, right? He was he was God in the flesh. He was sin free. He's our great example. But what about what about humans that aren't Jesus? He's really the only example that we have. He is the only example we have. It's someone that lives sin free. But how do we, how do we, how do we as humans deal with this? We're not Jesus, but we are His children. Self-centeredness. Where does this come from? So as we're born as infants, infants are very self-centered. I've seen them before. <laughs> they cry. They want something. That's all they think about. I need this. I want this. I'm going to have this. I'm going to cry and make noise and rant and rave until you get me where I want. <coughs> That's about the only awareness that they seem to have. Um, and, they, and it's, you know, it's, as a young, a new parent, you're, it's confusing because you're waiting on this child and all you've got is something that needs to be fed. Because this whole world revolves around survival. It revolves around, I need to eat, I need substance. There's a few other things I need I won't go into here. But that's what I need, and I don't want to hear anything else about it. So a child is very self-centered, very self-absorbed. But as the child grows up, in most cases, the child becomes aware of others. You see those, those, those uh, wonderful times when they smile and start <coughs> reflecting upon their parents. They think their parents are incredible and they, they, they really love their parents. They, wanna, they start expressing things to their parents. They start beginning to think of others. It becomes an awareness around us. The self 
and this begins to dampen a bit as a, as, as a, you know, a social awareness, awareness of the community begins to take shape. In Matthew 6, 24, it talks about uh, no one can serve two masters. Or he will either hate the one or love the other. Or he will be devoted to one or despise the other. You cannot serve God and well. The message there is that we, we, we can't serve two masters. And as we grow up and mature, we get our teenage years, we grow up and become adults. We, it, our grip on self-centeredness should begin to loosen. Right? We should begin to think of others. A lot of times it doesn't happen. Sometimes it does happen. But, but there is certainly at least an awareness. We're not totally consumed by ourselves at the point of end. We should mature. The same goes as Christians. We should mature as well. We need to have a more awareness of others. We make this decision to follow Christ at some point in our life. We decide that we're accountable enough and aware enough of others and Christ and our, our place in the world that we need to put him on a baptism. We need more than what we have. We want to join God. We want to join Christ. We want to, we've decided that we are going to serve God and not the world. With God, there's really no middle ground. You know, you're either with God or everything else. And it, it's a real binary decision. And we like to think that God is, the culture likes to think that God is, is a caring God. And surely He won't be as judgmental as I read in the Bible. Surely He won't be, I don't have to do everything. He loves me so much. He's such a kind, and this is such a happy thing that, you know, I just have to be part of it. I don't have to, I really don't have to follow God all the time. It's kind of when it's convenient. And it's easy for me. That's not what God tells us He wants us to do. That's, that's not the way we serve God. You know, many years ago, I was actually a real engineer, and I used to like do engineering things. And, and one of the things I learned in school and did for a while was, uh, was binary math, was Boolean algebra, how binary things work. I'm not going to go into a dissertation on this because it might embarrass me. But, but things are either zero or one. And that's the only thing. I mean, that's it. And in digital computers, if you're not a zero or a one, you're, you're not defined. The engineers spend a lot of time making sure a zero is a zero or a one's a one. And, uh, and, 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 and it's very important. The Bible's the same kind of Bible. The following God's the same way. With Jesus, we need to be all in. We need to follow Christ with every ounce of energy that we have. We need to be sure that we're doing everything that we can. Yes, there's grace. We can talk about grace. But God commands us to do certain things. He wants us to follow Him. He wants us to take up that cross and follow Him. And there's more to that than a casual relationship. And I think that's the key point of the message around carrying our cross or bearing our cross. This is serious business. God wants us to follow Him. So what's happening here in Mark 8? You know, rereading verses 31 through 33 in Mark 8. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Jesus took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing the disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not letting your mind on God's interest in man's. Jesus is plainly revealing here, actually for the first time, the suffering that he's going to have on the cross. This is the first time that it's been clear to the, to the disciples, the crowd, anybody, that he's going to have to suffer here and be rejected by all in order to fulfill his destiny. What I find really interesting here is Peter is rebuking Jesus. Now, what, who, would, who could do that? Rebuke Jesus? It just doesn't seem like a good idea. Of course, we've got all this hindsight. We know how the story ends. We know the, the, the deity and the human characteristics of Jesus. We know his impact. And Peter's still learning. But still, he rebukes Jesus. What's Peter thinking about here? Is he thinking of others? Is he thinking about God? He is thinking about himself. Peter is worried how this is all going to look. How's this going to appear? This guy we've been following putting our faith in looks like it's going to go bad for him. You know, this can't be true. Let me correct it. I'll just, you know, I'll set it straight. And uh, it doesn't last very long. Jesus stamps back pretty quick with the rebuke. <coughs> the situation is very dangerous. And I want you to think about that for a minute. This is a dangerous situation here. Peter's upset. He's trying to rebuke the Lord. Jesus rebukes Peter. I don't know. I don't want to be rebuked by Jesus. That, that sounds like uh, something that's not enjoyable. It is not something I ever want to experience. I want to be close to Jesus, but boy, be rebuked by him. It just doesn't feel very good. Not only does he rebuke him, he brings Satan into the equation. 
how did this happen? You know, just a guy or a for you. But Jesus recognized the situation. Jesus is human. He knows that, that he's going to have human feelings. And he has them now about this journey he's going on here. He recognizes that Satan is in the middle of this, trying to disrupt his plan. It's really Satan working through Peter, trying to just, you know, rebuke Jesus and correct him. But he's having none of it. Peter's reflecting Satan's nature, not necessarily God's nature here. And, and, and Jesus corrects the situation. One other tidbit of interest here is Jesus just doesn't talk to the apostles. He just doesn't rebuke Peter. We'll see in these next verses, he turns to everyone. And again, the Bible is for everyone. The God's good news is for everyone. The next phase of this of the self-centeredness is denying ourselves. This is where we have to move on from being focused on ourselves and the needs that we have. We have to deny ourselves things. That is not something that is that is well accepted in our society today. Who wants to deny themselves? That's not what that's not what we hear about. That's not what we should be doing. Not in American society today, actually for that matter, the world society. Denying yourself is just not cool. But that's that's what Jesus tells us to do as Christians. Rereading the last few verses of Mark chapter 8, and many ones, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take the cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me, and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with all the angels. Denial is, is declaring something to be untrue. We've seen people, you know, when they're accused of something, uh, and very publicly, the first thing they'll see is, oh, deny. And that's the first in the, in the, in the prescription for how to, you know, recover yourself from some publicly humiliating event if you're a public figure seems to be deny, deny, deny. And that's just advocating the truth. It's just, just flat out saying, I didn't do this. This is not happening. This is not the truth. Denial is a strong word. And we, and we see in these verses here, the call for us is, is to deny ourselves. In other words, the things that we want can't be true. The, the desires, the human desires, the self-centered desires that we have, we're called upon to deny those and make them untrue for us. <coughs> Follow Christ, as, as mentioned in these verses here, we're called upon to deny ourselves, to lose our life, and to take up the cross and follow Him. There's another famous denial in the Bible, Peter's denial. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to read all of this, but we know that uh, Peter was told by Christ that he would deny him three times. This is in the middle of a series of, of epic events. There's no other way to describe it. This is Jesus giving his life for the lost, sin, for the lost of the world, to pay the price for sins. In the middle of this, we have Peter told he's going to deny Christ three times. What does he do? First, you know, first opportunity, he's contested, questioned about his faith or his, you know, that he was with Jesus, that he was even with Jesus. He denies it. Not just one time, he didn't just stumble into it. Peter denies Christ three times, just as, as Christ said he would. So there's an example of denial going the other way. This is Peter denying Christ, denying the truth of Christ. And we know that, that this is a, uh, a foretold event by Christ. It's an event that just shatters Peter. And we find out later after the resurrection that it's a serious event when Jesus meets up with Peter and tries to make him good again. Or re relieve Peter's thought that he has been forgiven. So Peter, Peter's thinking of himself. He's afraid. That's the thing that happens to us a lot. Is we'll be afraid or challenged by our faith or about our thoughts where our heart is centered, and we, we panic, we don't, our sincerity is, our lack of sincerity is revealed, and, and we begin thinking of ourselves again, and how we're going to survive ourselves, and many times we may go so far as to deny Christ in situations. I think whenever that comes up, and you're in a situation where you're trying to fit in, like Peter was, or you're trying to not make waves, Think about Peter denying Christ, how serious that was. And, and how we, we are called upon to not deny Christ. Take up one's cross and follow me. We don't have crosses. I don't take up a cross. What does that mean to me? 
We all know about Roman crucifixion. We know about it since Jesus died that way. We know that a condemned person that was going to be crucified there, the burden of the cross. They had to carry it, the humility, the shame, everything that went with it, carrying the cross to the place where we're going to be crucified. It's a burden. It's a burden that's very public. It's a very humble burden that, that drives us to a level of, of, of repentance for our sins and understanding where we are, confessing, wanting to be part of Christ. But it's not easy. It's not easy to be a Christian. There are burdens to bear. And we're called upon to bear those burdens. Not just part of the burden, not just a piece of the cross, but the whole thing. And it's heavy. But that's our call. And that's, that's clear in these verses that we're to, to take up our cross and follow Him. We must be bold. We must not be ashamed of Christ. The verses mention the shame in here. I do not want to ever be considered someone that is ashamed of Jesus. I don't want to have to explain that someday, that I was ashamed of Jesus. I don't think any of us do. And he's telling us here what we have to do to not be ashamed of Jesus. The last section to cover here is materialism. Uh, we played this game over our... our Christmas holidays, my family, and, uh, my wife bought this game. I think it's called the Logo Game. And it, it's a question and answer game about the history of logos. These are like the old logos, Coca-Cola. Just think of any kind of logo you can think of. There'd be questions you'd have to answer. And, and this, this got me really thinking about advertisement and materialism and things. The game was fun. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not dissing the game. But it did, it did, I did think about it for a while afterwards, thinking about how these Logos and advertising have influenced our lives. And, and advertising slogans, they go on and on about how, to, you know, uh, have it your way, uh, just do it, the best a man can get, because you're worth it. So a, a lot of themes around self centeredness, and you're what matters. You're the really the thing that's important. And oh, by the way, I want your money. Uh, and so it, 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 that's how that's how the culture that we're in feels like. To me, the most intense version of this is fashion advertising. It's just, and I, I we do advertising at my, my job. I'm familiar with how it works. I work with ad agencies. And, you know, I, I think some of the things that we do are kind of edgy. But then you look, go, you start thinking about fashion. And it's just, it's off the chart. The pictures they have in malls, the photographs, the the image they try to portray of what you need to look like, it's a very personal, self-centered image. And, and you can say, well, hey, that's just an American thing. I can tell you here that it is not. Uh, I travel a good bit, and branding and personal fashion branding has taken root around the world. Far flung places of the world, this idea of self-centeredness and that you are what matters is being uh, communicated fervently. Materialism, I would say, is the struggle of our culture. It is the thing that we wrestle with the most. I think it's the barrier that challenges us to be Christians more than anything is materialism. It leads to corruption. Certainly we've seen that in our, in our, uh, in our world lately. It leads to divorce, financial problems in marriage. It leads to debt. I mean, if you've heard me talk about debt a lot, you know, what an evil, dark thing debt can be. Idolatry it can be the thing that we worship is materialism. Ultimately, all of these things lead to sin, with materialism being a key, key contributor to these things. Why do we struggle with this so much? We're a very affluent society. We need to be able to take advantage of what we've got. And, uh, you know, we, we want a better life for our children. We're bombarded with this. There's a feeling that we should be a part of this, that we should be <coughs> materialism. I think where there's strong materialism, the words eating us up, and we're considering it constantly, there's a lack of faith. Uh, materialism is not a new concept. We think about the rich young ruler who was asked many things about his beliefs. In, in, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, chapter 19, verse 16, I'll just read this. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to them, why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep these commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit a murder, you shall not commit adultery, 
Shall not steal, shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbors yourself. The young man said, All these things I have kept, why am I still lacking? And Jesus said, If you wish to be complete, go sell your positions, give to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But the young man heard this statement, and he went away grieving. For he was one who owned his property. This guy appears to be a good person. He's got it going on. He's obeying all the commands. He looks like he's somebody that we would admire. He looks like a good Sunday morning Christian. He looks like uh, uh, just someone that's my, uh, that, that we think has all of their sins controlled. He keeps the law, but ultimately he has an eye on his material things. He simply can't let them go. And, it, and it's the core of his law is that he's got to think he's got to have these material things. They're part of him. His faith is lacking. He doesn't have the faith to let them go and turn all things over to God. This is a very uh, enlightening scripture, I think, for us. And then each of us should ask the question, where do I stand with this? What would I do if I were called to do this? I don't think God calls us to be paupers. But he does call us. He does call us to understand our materialism and understand where it's, it is in relationship to, to God and our faith. How do we overcome materialism? <coughs> do we move somewhere else when there's no all this advertising? Can we escape it? Can we run and hide? I don't think we can. I think it's there with us. It's a sin that's, that's with us constantly. John chapter 14, chapter 14, verse 23 through 26. Jesus answered and said to them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him and will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. All these things I have spoken to you while abiding to you. But the helper of the Holy Spirit from the Father, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance of all that I have said to you. So the Holy Spirit is a comforter. Somebody to come to somebody. It's a deity that comes and bridges our connection with God. And Jesus' death on the cross it helps us understand the Word. It strengthens our faith. And that's something that, that we need to fight materialism and self-centeredness. For, our, for ourselves, when we talk about denying things, one of the key elements is separating what we need from what we want. And that's a question that needs to run around our minds all the time. Talking to myself here clearly. Do I really need this? Do I just want this? It, it's a test for everything. And, and I think it, at a minimum, it will prove your financial situation if you seriously ask this question and deny yourself some things. Actually, it feels pretty good to do that sometimes. Say, you know, I made this decision, but I didn't really, I didn't really need this. I wanted it. And reflecting upon that can be a very good thought about how God commands us to spend our time and our thoughts and, and, and where we should put our priorities. Uh, turn to Colossians 3, 12-17 as we come towards the end of the lesson here. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on the heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another. Forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint, complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Um, the other, the other key thing that helps us in our struggle with sin, with self-centeredness, with materialism, surprisingly, may be the love. Love is the is the is the greatest command. And this doesn't apply at certain times. It applies to everything. If we're struggling with materialism, if we're not centered on what we think we need to be centered on, which is God, if our faith is not strong, you can love yourself into a stronger connection with God. You can do that by loving God. You can do that by loving each other. Loving your spouse. Loving your children. Loving everyone. Love your neighbor. Love drives good thoughts, it drives good comments, it drives questions, it drives consideration for others, it drives compassion. There's not much time for self-centeredness when you're loving. And there's not much time for materialism when you're constantly loving. Love doesn't go out and spend things, spend money on worthless items or non-needed items. 
Love concerns itself with others and the well-being of others. Love concerns itself with God. In summary, self-centeredness is a root of sin. Materialism is born out of self-centeredness. It's been with us since the original sin. It's flowed to us and it's still amongst us. Sin is not going anywhere until we're all called to heaven. We must be with Christ. We can't be lukewarm. Christ calls us to be with Him. Not sort of be with Him, but be with Him. Love conquers all. We need to love each other. We need to love God. So tonight, if, if you're caught up in self-centeredness and materialism, if you haven't been able to deny Christ, if you haven't taken <coughs> on in baptism, if you're struggling with sin, if you're struggling with, with taking up that cross and following Him, and you want the prayers of this congregation, if there's a particular sin that's a hindrance, this connection with God. We ask that come now as we stand and sing.